Hello. <laughs> Welcome to the next edition on, on Builder Studio. Uh, as said, my name is Elmo. I'm the Chief Product Officer here at Slush. With me is Stan Garmark from Spotify, uh, the VP Global Head of Consumer Experience. Uh, welcome, Stan. Thanks for being here. Thanks for having me. I'm excited to be here. All right. Uh, before we start with the topic of the day, Stan, you've been at Spotify since 2011. Uh, can you tell us about your personal journey at Spotify uh, and also a little bit about your current role? Yeah, uh, I joined it in 2011, as you said. And I, I, was, I came there to build out our ubiquity strategy. Uh, ubiquity is a little bit of a weird word, but it's making sure that Spotify is available on all types of platforms, speakers, cars, uh, TVs, integrated into apps and so on. When I joined, uh, Spotify existed on the desktop uh, and on mobile. Uh, then, you know, currently I got a little bit of a bigger role uh, looking after Spotify on all uh, consumer uh, platforms, including PC and mobile. And of course, I've had some kind of side jobs along the way to leading some other strides for the company, including uh, the podcast stride that we're going to be talking about, and kind of laddering up from our first product to our second product. All right. Thank you for the quick introduction. Uh, we will dive into all of those topics deeper. Uh, but now, uh, let's kick things off with a more general question. Uh, if there's people who are not that familiar with the topic of the day, what is the product proposition? Well, the way that we, that we think about it, it's, it's the promise. Uh, it's a promise to a potential user or customer uh, of our service. Uh, and then the experience that we build is the thing that delivers on that promise. Uh, and what's so fascinating with humans is that they have this weird combination of being perpetually really happy with what they do. When you try to sell them a new thing, they're not interested. They don't care about you because they're happy with what they have. But once you have them and they're in your experience, they're perpetually unhappy about that experience and, uh, and it's never good enough. Um, but that, that proposition is really the thing uh, that we think about, the thing that we need to get the new user, the new uh, customer in the door. Uh, so, uh, it's a really important part of uh, the strategy. All right, thank you for the, for the insight. Now, let's go back in time. Uh, before all of the podcasts and mobile and everything, you, well, initially you started focusing on music, uh, especially on, on the desktop. Uh, can you kind of tell us about a little bit about the early days of Spotify's product journey and also what made the initial product proposition so magical? Yeah. Um, I mean, maybe to set the context, this is kind of hard to remember, but at the time, you know, users found themselves uh, in a world of, you know, if they wanted to listen to music, either they had to go buy a CD for like $18, uh, iTunes was around, so you could buy a song for 99 cents, or uh, what most people did, I guess, here and in Sweden, was that you went to uh, Pirate Bay or Kazaa, and you downloaded uh, music for free. So you like searched a lot, you found a bunch of spam and then you know some of the stuff was good, some was bad, you have to work on your metadata and eventually put into your Winamp or iTunes. So, like you can do a lot of work to get uh, a, a free experience. Uh, but the, the proposition that we went to market with was basically you know imagine that you get iTunes but you've all you bought all these you know millions and millions of tracks and they're already installed in your hard drive for free, and you can just hit play, create a playlist. So that was the, the original proposition. So it, like, it was a magical, like, that can't be true. Are you real? Like, I need to check that out. So it like, really got people excited without having experienced it. They felt like, this is a thing that I have to try. It's just too good to be true. And then they tried it, and they couldn't believe their ears. That's, that's fantastic. Uh, maybe, maybe to generalize that a bit, uh, so why is this initial um, product proposition so important? And like, what can founders do to make sure that you know, their product proposition matches what the, you know, the, what the world is looking for? Yeah. I think it's really important to pick apart those two pieces, the, the proposition and the experience. Sometimes they're the same thing, sometimes, sometimes they're not exactly the same thing. 
uh, humans are they're amazingly poor predictors of their own future behavior. <laughs> uh, or actually, what they did like earlier th today. Uh, when we like, survey people what they do, how much they use it, they have no idea. Um, so it's really important to, with a proposition, to get them excited about something, get them to try something, get them to be interested. Uh, a colleague of mine uh, uh, runs our personalization. Uh, he has this wonderful way of, of probing his product managers all the time, whatever they build, and like whatever he gets in front of them. Now ask two questions. Uh, you know, imagine the user, and the user is confused, and they don't care. So how can you improve the product and the proposition? Uh, so they're not going to care. You need something for them to care. Uh, and then you need to something that they engage with. And that might not always be that first thing. So people might imagine in the beginning, oh, it's all about like finding this track that I couldn't uh, listen to. But what they ended up doing with them, creating playlists. But maybe selling the idea of creating playlists was not the, the thing that got people in the door. But that's what people did. And that was what was retaining in the product. You search, you create a playlist, and you listen to those playlists. Um, so I mean, I can go on about this for hours. Uh, but, but maybe keep it there, like a too good to be too proposition at the top of the funnel and then something that drives engagement, that keeps you around, drives retention, uh, and then conversion uh, later on. Can you elaborate a little bit still on the, on the playlists you mentioned? Like, is it something that you kind of build, and then you notice that people were using it heavily? Or was it like, we are going to build this amazing sort of playlist feature first, and then people came? That, that was built at the, at the outset. I mean, in the beginning, to be, to be frank, I mean, the, the innovation you know, oftentimes when you create something, you, know, you need an innovation of some sort. And there were two innovations that uh, kind of were Spotify in the beginning. One was a technology innovation in being able to stream and not having that kaza experience of having to wait uh, and just in instantly play. That was a technology innovation. But the other innovation was a business model innovation. Uh, and in our experience, anything truly big and meaningful that we do has both kind of a, an experience innovation and a business model innovation. If it's only one or the other, it tends not to be a big thing at the end of it. Um, so it was a, way to, a different way to pay the right soldiers with advertising and, and, uh, and premium subscriptions that drove that. All right. Um, so you obviously kind of nailed the initial proposition and you had this killer feature against, against the composition, uh, competition. Uh, and focused on the desktop player for a few years. But after that, you went mobile and then free on mobile. Um, can you tell us about those shifts and why, we're, why they were so important in kind of developing this uh, wider product proposition? Yeah. Uh, I mean, we are in a, in a market where we have our suppliers are the creators, the, the art music artists. Uh, and of course, they need to get paid. And we needed to pay from the beginning. We couldn't like, create engagement and then start to figure out monetization later which you can do uh, if you're like a social app, for instance. Um, so we need to monetize right away. Uh, and that meant that we have a, a free tier that was advertising supported, and we had a premium tier of subscriptions. And at the beginning, that was on desktop. And the, the reason to go convert to paid was to get, out of, get rid of the ads. Uh, but then the iPhone came, and the App Store came. Uh, and uh, we built a mobile app on iPhone, uh, and after some back and forth with Apple, given that they had iTunes and they were particularly in love with the idea of us competing with them. Um, they allowed us to launch uh, the iPhone app. And I mean, the impetus for that from us was, of course, m music has been mobile for a long while with Walkmans and uh, you know, you know, music in the car and so on. So it was obvious to us just to iterate on the product, to deliver more value, to create more engagement, to bring Spotify mobile. But it turned out to be this amazing conversion driver. So that was a premium feature only in the beginning to be on mobile. And it was fantastic at converting free to paid. So it was really with mobile that the full business model came to life. Um, so it was very, very important. Then we did, I mean, there was a big thing that happened after that, uh, which was go free on mobile. Uh, and we actually saw. This doesn't like, so much come from like, the demand at the time, but we saw what the trend was. There was a macro win coming, uh, and that was the macro win of mobile. 
you know, when the iPhone came, you know, uh, you know, some people had it, but most people didn't have it. Uh, but there was this Mary Meeker put out a report of this exponential growth for how mobile would take over the world and like desktop was going to be down here somewhere. And, you know, Daniel and the team looked at that like, whoa, our company's going to go away. This is not going to work. Our whole strategy for our whole customer acquisition strategy is going to go. Uh, and we need to like pivot the whole company and flip the whole business model. Uh, and we need to get the top of the funnel to be on mobile in the future. And then we need to find a different way to convert. So that was pretty, that could have been the end of the company if we're ahead of that um, challenge before it came. So we started working on that years before. Uh, and then there was another, it's not a macro wind uh, for the whole world, but we had new competition. And we had YouTube. So YouTube had been growing like crazy at the same time and kind of almost like accidentally ending up being a music player where you can play any music track on demand for free too with a video. Uh, so we had that competition uh, and Google having acquired them. So as we created our mobile free tier, we had to think about both this macro win, like we need to embrace a macro win, you shouldn't fight it. But we also look at, look at competition, like it's powerful competitors and uh, we tend to then find a way to want to counter position them. So we needed a new free tier. So we created a free tier where you could stream music for free in the background, but it was only in shuffle mode. Uh, so you had to convert if you wanted to play on demand. There's so still a limit, no, there is a limitation to the product. It was a counter positioning to, to YouTube. It was a counter position to Apple that we expected to come. Uh, and the counter positioning was that we uh, were ad funded top of the funnel where they hate ads and they went all into privacy. So we thought like Apple and YouTube are going to take a couple of years before they copy this thing and we're going to have a very clear differentiated proposition top of the funnel that still would be a must have for a, for a non-user. So sort of the long, long answer there, but <laughs> no, there was no, a no. lot of nuance to that, to that strategy yeah. going in there, but it's super powerful. And then we had this massive growth spurt uh, uh, that we've been writing uh, after that. Yeah, that's uh, fantastic insights, especially on like reading the reading the landscape and like deriving that into into your product strategy. Um, in the beginning, you kind of mentioned that you were hired uh, to execute this ubiquity strategy, which is your term for being integrated into a lot of things, from, from smart speakers to cars. I think I had Spotify on my PlayStation Three like 11 years ago or something. Um, can you kind of talk about the role of partnerships? When did that become relevant? And like, what are the learnings in partnering up with companies, even those who are potentially competitors? Yeah, I think a lot of companies find themselves having to partner to be a viable product. I mean, you need to be partnering with suppliers and maybe some distribution partners. Uh, of course, we've been partnering with the creator side since inception. Um, but here we found ourselves pretty early on, you know, obviously music needs to be, you know, music streaming needs to go to all the places where mu music used to be, you know, it needs to be in the car, it needs to be in the living room, it needs to be, you know, when you're working out uh, and, you know, all these social apps, music has always been part of the conversation between people, so we need to be there. Um, it's pretty obvious just from a you know, pure iteration on the, on the proposition experience to go there. Um, and, but we could get started on like a Windows PC and a Mac and actually the iPhone, uh, a pretty, pretty open environment and then Android. We didn't have to truly partner with anyone to do that. Uh, but to go, in, go into a connected speaker, well, there was kind of no connected speakers at the time. There was like Sonos and one Logitech speaker, basically. Uh, but we was like, there are going to be these new, every other type of consumer product is going to be connected to the internet. Uh, and they're not app environment. Uh, they're embedded environment. We need to form a partnership to get integrated. PlayStation is a great example. Uh, so we got integrated into the operating system so you can play in the background while playing games. So that's a very deep integration, put a part of our library inside the operating system. Um, so and then in our world, as, as you talk about like competitors, some of these partners were also our competitors or would be competitors or current competitors. We we're partnering with Microsoft, they had a competing streaming service. Sony had a competing streaming service. Now our biggest partner Samsung, they had a competing music streaming service. Everyone's a competitor. <laughs> uh, and that's, 
I think there's an interesting uh, dynamic there because in the beginning when you're small, these partners that you need, they tend to want to use you for something and they essentially want to like white label you. Um, and there's this tricky balance of, of finding a partnership that actually works and holding off. We said no a lot of times. Most of the partnerships didn't happen with these competitors because like we were not willing to play ball you know, at, at, on the rules. And then we waited a little bit more. Uh, we were, there were so many times with Samsung before we did this integration that we have right now. They were integrating every smartphone, every Samsung product in the whole world. Um, so it needs to make sense for both, both parties. And I think it's important that you, you know, think about your own company and like, who do you want to be? And what problems do you want to solve? And it has some pretty big implications for margin and profits in the long term. Uh, you, need to, you need to solve a really hard problem to actually get any money out at the end of it. Um, so, you know, we stayed pretty uh, true to like the idea like it needs to be Spotify that the consumer is using through, through other services. And then being very honest in the conversation, figuring out what both parties need, what both parties' hopes and dreams are, but also what the fears are to mitigate for those fears. Uh, and we've been able to, you know, partner with Apple and Amazon and Google uh, still, and, and they are also, of course, competitor of ours. Uh, yeah, what's, what's, uh, what's been the like, most difficult part of these big partnerships? Um, my, I think that the, the most difficult part, but, but I also think the most fun part, is just to partner with ongoing competition. Um, and, and go at it, like come, come with a very honest uh, approach to it. Like, this is what we, if I were you, you know, imagine, you have to expect that everyone's a smart person that does you know, do rational things. So, you know, if I were you, I would want to do these and these things. You know, you know, you could expect that we probably want to do these and these things. We, we optimize for those metrics. What do you optimize for? What do you care about right now? So, like, honest about the, the, the situation that you're going into. And, like, can we find something that we can mutually benefit from? And is there a way to mitigate for the concerns that we both have? Can we kind of fend off some data? You know, is the organization set up in such a way where this information doesn't, you know, doesn't leak and so on? And I've been astonished in how, how well this works yeah. and how strong of relationships and partnerships you can build with your own competitors. Yeah, so you're kind of looking for that mutual benefit instead of like the one serving the other sort of as a consultant almost. Yeah, and the relationships are so important. Uh, so, I mean, I have some, some of these guys on speed dial. I mean, if, if there is a problem with the Google partnership, you know, there's someone I can text and we, we talk later in the afternoon and we can resolve it because we've been working for so long and we know that we have good intentions and that we understand each other and then we can like work things, work things through. Exactly. All right. Next, I'd love to talk about post podcasts. Um, kind of let's go into the decision uh, to focus on podcasts. Like why did you decide that was going to be the sort of second product? Yeah. Uh, I mean, a couple of things there. I mean, it starts actually with us analyzing what's going on on the platform. We always do that. Quant, qual, what's, what's happening? And the initial part was actually in Germany. We had the creator side, like the supply side, like hacking the product. We like found that there were all these audiobooks being uploaded to, to the service as music albums. And well, the German listeners were listening a lot. Uh, it was a pretty horrible experience. Like you, you stop playing and you figure out where you were and what track, <laughs> and the experience was not built for that. Uh, but still, they did it. And on the free tier, it was shuffled chapters. I mean, that you can't listen there. So, so this was premium premium users listen. So, so there's something there, and people hacking the product. And I think that could also be always be a, a good indication that there's an opportunity here. If someone in your constituent is trying to do something with your product that you hadn't intended for it, you go check that out. Uh, the the other part was that we. We thought that, when we looked at podcasts, it seemed like there's something that we could add to the world here. Podcasts have been around for, for a long time, but not, it was growing slowly, and um, just uh, ads for mattresses and Squarespace, um, and kind of it felt like it's still. And so we looked at that, like, it seemed like there's so much innovation going on in, in video and, and social and internet, mobile. But that innovation doesn't seem to happening in podcast. Why is that not happening? Well, it seems to be because 
Podcasts are essentially being run by Apple, but they don't, they don't, they don't have a business model for this. So it kind of doesn't, ma doesn't matter to them. It shouldn't matter to them. And we felt that we should be better placed to create, you know, create more value here. And we felt that we, could, we can probably get many, many more people to listen to podcasts. There's so much great content there, but people don't know. Uh, and, and that means that we can help creators find an audience. And then you look at the monetization technology there. It was like, this is 1998 ad tech, when you basically burned in, uh, you had no targeting. Um, and the, con the, the ads that you saw, the consequence of the limitations of technology. So we think we could fix monetization, and like truly like drive up uh, the revenues from this to make sure that we can get, have more creators. Um, and also from a business standpoint, I think there was an interesting opportunity at scale for us there. This could be a high margin business um, and we could integrate it. There's this Jim Barksdale quote, there are only two ways to make money in business, bundling and unbundling. And we thought that by bundling music and, and podcast, they could drip, drive kind of a shared LTV, drive better retention, more engagement, you know, ultimately drive more premium uh, conversion and, and lower premium churn, in addition to the ad revenue that we get there. So a lot of like different reasons, like, it, like, good, uh, like a good opportunity from like, there's something to solve for the world um, uh, and, uh, and it could be a good business. So you kind of started from how the users were already using the platform, or like misusing maybe yes. uh, more, <laughs> more accurately. Can you uh, kind of generalize a little bit on like, what's the process of discovering new opportunities at Spotify and um, like, how do you validate then those uh, kind of new new products? Um, I, I think there are, there are three three types of, of uh, opportunities that we always look at. Is the macro trends, you know, the the, the move to mobile. Uh, recently, the, the move from media apps from going to recommendations coming from your friends to recommendations coming from uh, uh, from the whole network and, and ML, AI generally. Uh, so those kinds of trends is something that we're always on the lookout for. Uh, then there is the, we look at uh, what people are doing on our platform. And we can, we can we call, quant all the time what's going on. Is there something that we can solve even better, blow up um, a, a need that we are not serving? You know, as, as in, the, in, the, in the beginning, as an example, you know, people that knew about music, they could search, find it, create a playlist, but then normal pay, people came in and they needed playlists for someone else to create for them. So we can always iterate uh, uh, on that. And then the third thing is competition. Um, we are, and there's this quote, uh, the paranoid are after us. Uh, that's very true, I think. Um, so we're always kind of on the lookout for what competition is doing. Um, uh, we can never stand still. If we stand still, we're going to be eaten. We need to always move on. Uh, so those are the three ways. Uh, and, but then we come up with ideas by looking at Qualquant from our platform and all these other trends. Like, there's a creative space and like a conversation that needs to happen. Like, can we find something? And then we design something, we prototype something, then we qual test that with user research and on ourselves. And then ultimately we, we AB everything with Quant. Um, uh, at the end of it. I mean, at the end of the day, the only actual uh, real you know, I I insights come from the quant at the end of it. All right. That's a lot of, lot of applicable advice there. Uh, all right. We are almost running out of time, uh, but uh, I'd love to finish things off with, uh, with a bit of a broad question. But uh, after, you know, 16 years, uh, how does Spotify stay innovative? Is it something about the culture or like, how do you keep coming up with new new product innovation? Yeah, I, I think fundamentally this is a cultural question, uh, and culture is what what you do when your manager isn't looking. Uh, and it, it needs to start at the top, so it, it's something you need to talk about, and you need to talk about it over and over and over again. So you need to create the the incentives, uh, and you need to fund it. You can't just talk about it; you need to put resources against it. Uh, and, and then thirdly, I think you need to succeed. 
from time to time. You're not going to succeed always, and we spend most of the time on all the things that work. There's so many things that fail spectacularly over the years uh, that you learn from. Um, but you need to have enough of a, of a kind of a uh, success rate so that you're willing to kind of keep funding new bets. Uh, and there, an important part of that, whenever you do something new, when you're like Spotify, that the, the new thing you do, at least there needs to be a vision where it can be material in relationship to the existing big business. And then you need to demonstrate success along the way, like you're growing exponentially at a faster rate, so you're going to catch up to that, that existing business. Because if you don't, the organizations can get distracted, and like eventually things can get shut down. So um, I'd say those are the things, like the, the culture, talking about it from the top, uh, funding it, and having some reasonable success rate. That's uh, fantastic, fantastic advice for all. Uh, I think that's a wrap. Uh, thank you all for coming, and uh, big thanks for you, Stan. Thank you.